Verapamil and dotiazem are non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. They do not end in DIPINE like the dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker class. So the class that the calcium channel blocker belongs to determines how selective it is for the myocardial or vascular smooth muscle cell calcium channels. Now, verapamil is highly selective for the myocardium, while dotiazem has an intermediate selectivity for both cardiac and vascular smooth muscle channel receptors with just a little bit more towards the myocardium. So let's look at this diagram. Both of these L-type calcium channel blockers decrease the slope of the pacemaker action potential because they decrease the influx of calcium. Remember, calcium is responsible for the upstroke of phase four in pacemaker action potential. Now, what does this look like on an electrocardiogram? We're gonna see an increase in the PR interval Remember, the PR interval represents the period in which the impulse is delayed through the AV node. Now, why do we prolong repolarization in the AV node? Well, the potassium channels that open to allow the efflux of potassium for repolarization open when they have been activated by the calcium influx. So, if we're blocking the calcium channels responsible for changing the voltage to open these potassium channels, it is going to take longer for all of the potassium channels to be activated. Therefore, we lengthen or prolong the repolarization. This prolongation of repolarization also has an effect on the number of available calcium channels for the next depolarization. This means that we have increased our effective refractory period because we only have some calcium channels available for a local impulse. We need to wait longer to create a full action potential that can propagate to other cells. Now for this reason, these drugs are very helpful in rate controlling atrial fibrillation. Now when we're talking about rate control, we're talking about decreasing the response of the AV node. We don't want the AV node to respond to all of the atrial depolarizations. Remember, there's many single wavelets of depolarization from a fibrillating atrium. We don't want every single one to be conducted by the AV node into the ventricles. We want the AV node to be refractory to more depolarizations. In this way, we can control the rate of ventricular contraction. Now, the same thing can be said for supraventricular tachycardias. Supraventricular just means that something above the ventricles is responsible for the fast or tachycardic rate. The problem in a supraventricular tachycardia is that there is an impulse traveling in loops through the AV node. So if you imagine this is our AV node here, there is a re-entry circuit that is looping around and around and around within the AV node. It is constantly depolarizing the atria up here, and when it loops back around, it's constantly going to be depolarizing the ventricles. It is a loop of depolarization in the AV node that is re-entering on itself over and over again. Now, verapamil and dotiazem increase the refractory period. That means they increase the refractoriness of the AV node so that either this pathway or this pathway will be refractory when this loop of depolarization comes back around. This terminates the supraventricular tachycardia. All right, so now we need to discuss the side effects. So if we decrease calcium conductance in the pacemaker cells, we could potentially do this excessively. We could actually end up causing sinus node depression, AV block, and even acute heart failure if we really depress the heart to the point that it's unable to contract efficiently. Now, what about the other ones, the constipation, the flushing, and the edema? Remember, we are blocking calcium channels. We can also start blocking them in other locations, including the interstitial cells of Cajal. These are the ones that are responsible for the slow wave potentials that cause the intrinsic peristaltic movements of the intestines. If you block these calcium channels that are in the intestinal smooth muscle, you better believe that your patient is going to feel constipated. This is because their gut is hypocontractile because you're blocking these cells. Now the flushing and the edema are due to the excessive vasodilatation that occurs from blocking the calcium channels responsible for vascular smooth muscle contraction in the skin and also in the extremities. When vessels near the skin surface dilate really large, you can see redness and even feel the heat coming off from the blood inside the dermal vessels. These very dilated vessels can also get very leaky and allow some transudation of fluid into the interstitium, and this is responsible for the edema that you can see as a side effect of these drugs. All right, now let's move on to some other antiarrhythmics. Adenosine is a purine nucleoside. 
It has several mechanisms of action depending on the receptor that it's binding. When adenosine binds A to A receptors in the coronary arteries, there's going to be an increase in cyclic AMP and also opening of potassium channels. In addition, there's going to be a sharp drop in calcium reuptake. All of these lead to vascular smooth muscle cell relaxation. Vascular smooth muscle cell relaxation leads to coronary artery vasodilatation. Now we're interested in the antiarrhythmic activity of adenosine, which is mainly due to the activation of the adenosine A1 receptor. This is mainly found in places like the AV node. When adenosine binds to A1 receptors in the AV node, it's going to activate the inhibitory GI protein. This is going to lead to an inhibition of adenocyclase. Inhibition of adenocyclase leads to a drop in cyclic AMP, and without any cyclic AMP around, we do not activate protein kinase A. Remember, protein kinase A is key in opening the calcium channels that allow for the upstroke in pacemaker cell depolarization. So decreasing the calcium conductance, which is mainly responsible for the depolarization of the AV node, is useful in treating supraventricular tachycardias. This is because we want to ensure that all the depolarizations originating somewhere above the ventricles hit the AV node when it is not done repolarizing from the previous signal. This is the way that we can rate control things. We control the rate at which the ventricles are stimulated because we decrease the conductance through the AV node. Now, adenosine binds to adenosine receptors. These are a type of purinergic receptor. Remember that we said adenosine is a purinucleoside. Any molecule that has attributes of a purine can bind to these adenosine receptors. Caffeine and theophylline block the effects of adenosine by competing at the adenosine receptors. Now, why does this happen? Well, here is a picture of adenosine. It is literally made up of an adenine molecule bound to a ribose sugar. Now here is caffeine, and here we see theophylline. All of these guys are essentially purines. This means that they can fight with each other at the adenosine receptor. Here you go. Look at this. Both theophylline and caffeine look very similar to that adenine group that we circled on the adenosine molecule. So the similarity of these groups allows theophylline and caffeine to just chill and block adenosine from binding its receptor. The side effects of flushing, hypotension, chest pain, and a sense of impending doom are all due to the same mechanism. This is excessive vascular vasodilatation, secondary to smooth muscle relaxation. A particularly high yield one is coronary steel syndrome. This is the one that can give your patient chest pain, and we get worried about chest pain, right? Here is the image we saw when we discussed coronary steel the first time. Again, there's an atherosclerotic plaque here. It's limiting flow through this branch of the coronary artery. This segment is already maximally dilated. It's already used all its compensatory mechanisms to increase flow. Now, if we give adenosine, we can only increase the diameter of the normal vessel. This will result in increased flow through the normal vessel while the already maximally dilated will not change. This can further exacerbate the oxygen deprivation of the myocardium being supplied by the artery with the atherosclerotic plaque inside of it. Now another high yield side effect, because it can be deadly, is bronchospasm. Adenosine can trigger mast cell degranulation within bronchial smooth muscle. This can be very dangerous because mast cells have a lot of compounds that can actually induce smooth muscle contraction. All right, now let's keep pushing. Magnesium is key in controlling the elimination of potassium in the urine, and it acts as a cofactor for the ability of this pump to work, the sodium-potassium ATPase. As you can see here, we have magnesium. For this reason, magnesium is particularly useful in situations that we may have abnormal potassium concentrations that trigger an arrhythmia, and we're talking about torsade. It is also useful as a sodium-potassium pump inducer to restore intracellular and extracellular ion concentrations. That means magnesium is excellent for reversing digoxin toxicity because it will induce the activity of this pump that digoxin inhibits. Remember, digoxin binds here at the extracellular potassium binding site and it inhibits this pump from working. Excellent guys, we are done. Now take a break, watch some Netflix, and then come back to see if you can answer the test yourself questions. All right, guys, now let's do some test yourself questions. 
we have a 57-year-old man with a medical history significant for angina and hypertension. He presents because of worsening angina. He treats each episode with sublingual nitroglycerin, but has noticed that over the past year, the frequency of these episodes has increased from once a week to daily. Now, this patient is currently taking lisinopril. A note in the chart indicates that the patient is allergic to metropolol, so a calcium channel blocker is added to the patient's regimen. This medication has a clinical effect most similar to that of metropolol. Now, which of the following calcium channel blockers is most indicated? All right, so we have a middle-aged dude with hypertension presenting due to an increase in the frequency and severity of angina episodes that he treats with nitroglycerin. He is taking lisinopril but cannot start metoprolol due to a drug allergy, so we need to give him a calcium channel blocker that acts similar to a beta blocker. Now, which one of these has a similar mechanism of action in the sense that it will eventually lead to the decrease in the intracellular calcium influx? This isn't necessarily a question of how to treat someone, but knowing the mechanisms of how a beta blocker works and how a non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker will also have the same effect as a beta blocker. So in this case, we need to determine that the answer is going to be verapamil. Verapamil has very little effect on vascular smooth muscle cells. Remember, it mainly inhibits the calcium channels. Now why isn't the answer DILT? Well, DILT has a very low affinity for calcium channels in the heart compared to verapamil. It is not necessarily the wrong answer, but it is just because a better option, such as verapamil, is there. Now, all of the other options end in DIPINE. See here, lodipine, nifedipine, nimodipine. These are dihydropyridines. We know that all of these drugs are way more selective for vascular smooth muscle calcium channels. Okay, next question is coming up. In the emergency department, an 80-year-old man with an ICD has persistent episodes of ventricular tachycardia despite attempted cardioversion. He is admitted and started on oral amiodarone. His ventricular tachycardia improves and he is released. However, weeks later, he begins to manifest drug-associated adverse effects. Now, which of the following signs and symptoms would suggest amiodarone toxicity? Long vignette with a punchline of, do you know the toxicities of amiodarone? You'll see a lot of these on step one. You don't even have to know all the toxicities to answer the question, but for real life you should. Now, which one of these is a possible toxicity of amiodarone? Well, we talked about how amiodarone contains lots of iodine, so it can actually cause thyroiditis. If we are damaging the thyroid gland, we can have a release of the hormones initially that are stored there. So we leak T3 and T4 out of the thyroid initially to cause a hyperthyroid state. Now, do you see any answer choice that will show high levels of thyroxin and triiodothyronine in the blood? That's right, E. Answer choice E describes hyperthyroidism. Weight loss, hyperreflexia, chest palpitations are all signs of amiodarone causing damage to the thyroid resulting in leakage of thyroid hormones into the blood. Now, what about these other answer choices? Well, we know amiodarone can damage the lungs, so you probably wanted to jump all over answer B. I wanted to do that. So remember, amiodarone causes pulmonary fibrosis. The increased fibroelastic tissue will actually lead to a decrease in the FEV1. Why is this? It's because the excess elastic tissue from the fibrosis is acting like a huge spring. B cannot be the answer because the FEV1 FEV ratio would actually increase. It would not decrease. This is because the fibrosis is adding recoil like a huge spring. Now, deep venous thrombosis and hypertension are not what is going on in this patient. Dysuria, hematuria, and flank pain are describing some signs and symptoms of acute pyelonephritis. This has nothing to do with amiodarone toxicity. Okay, guys, one last question, and then you're done. A 78-year-old woman presents to the outpatient clinic complaining of nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Her medical history is significant for hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and AFib. She states that for the past four hours, everything she has seen has had a blurry yellow tint to it. Several abnormalities are detected on ECG, including T-wave inversion, an increased PR interval, and a decreased QT interval. What is the mechanism of action of the medication responsible for these symptoms? 
we're almost done. We can do this. We got this. You have an elderly lady with a past medical history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and AFib now reporting nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and blurry yellow tinted vision. Her EKG is screaming hints with inverted T waves. You can see that right here. In addition to that, they've described an increased PR interval and a decreased QT interval. This is a really straightforward question loaded with information. First, you have to remember which drug has all these side effects. Then you need to consider the drug and recall the mechanism of action. This is how step one is going to be. Instead of just remembering the drug, you need to take it one step further and also remember its mechanism in addition to the toxicities. Even if you do not remember the drug name, some of these things could trigger your memory. So inverted T waves should automatically make you think about a hyperkalemic state. Do you see an option in the answer choices that could cause an increase in the amount of extracellular potassium? Yep, you sure do. The answer choice E is the correct answer because it explains the mechanism of how we can get high levels of potassium in the extracellular environment. We're talking about the drug digoxin here. All of the side effects listed on here should be making you think digoxin, especially the blurry yellow tinted vision. In addition to that, the combination of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or screaming digoxin all over this answer choice. Okay guys, I hope that was a helpful cardiology review. Best of luck on your step one. It's going to be tough, but you're going to dominate it.